Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcelo Suarez Orozco, Chancellor of Boston's only public research university. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to our beautiful Harbor campus for this timely discussion on representation in higher education. I'm delighted to see so many friends of UMass Boston back on campus. Our governor, Governor Maura Healy, Attorney General Andrea Campbell, Secretary of Education Patrick Tackweiler, Commissioner Noe Ortega, Assistant Secretary Catherine Lemon. Last time I saw the Assistant Secretary was at the UCLA Lab School many, many years ago. I am so, so happy to welcome so many other distinguished leaders. It is a great honor to have all of you with us here today. And if this is your first visit to Columbia Point, I hope you will have an opportunity to explore our gorgeous campus and take in the stunning views of the harbor and the Boston skyline. The conversation we will have today on equity, access, and representation in higher education is an important conversation. In light of the Supreme Court ruling that race cannot be a factor in college admissions. Let me paraphrase Harry Truman. Education and diversity are too important to leave it to the justices of the Supreme Court. As a minority serving institution, the most diverse university in New England and the third most diverse university in the country, UMass Boston's experience in creating a diverse learning environment that empowers and values all students is relevant, particularly given our state's long history of leadership in education. Indeed, as we're facing an extraordinary demographic transformation, where minoritized population are now the fastest growing sector of our, our demography in the Commonwealth, it is the eyes of the world will remain on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as we examine, as we explore, as we engineer strategies for advancing representation in higher education. For UMass Boston, our diversity is a point of great pride. Great pride. 66% of our students identify as black, indigenous, and people of color. And 59% are first, 59%, like your chancellor, are first generation to college, the first in their families to attend college. I am moved by the work we are all doing to instill a sense of belonging and make UMass Boston a beacon of hope for historically underrepresented students, a place where our students can and will succeed. I am proud that UMass Boston is a leader in research and scholarship that informs new educational models built around the unique experiences, life experiences, of all our students. And it is the honor of a lifetime to prepare these remarkable students to be tomorrow's engineers, nurses, computer scientists, urban planners, educators, teachers, nurses, to serve the great city of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Let me close by saying UMass Boston is your university. I'll say it in Spanish. Mi casa es su casa. UMass Boston es su casa. Boston's campus is an indispensable resource for addressing the priorities of Governor Healy's administration, such as bolstering the healthcare workforce, mitigating the impacts of climate change, and tackling inequality. 
in his spirited convocation address here in this very room last month, Secretary Tatweiler challenged all of us to run, not walk, in pursuit of social change. Mr. Secretary, please know that we are here at UMass Boston. We stand ready to run with you, with Commissioner Ortega, with General Campbell, with Governor Healy, and the entire Healy administration. With that, please join me in giving a warm, warm beacon welcome to our governor, the first woman, the first openly LGBTQ person elected governor in the Commonwealth's history, the Honorable Maura Healy. We love you, Governor. Good morning. Oh. Well, thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you, and happy Monday. Good morning. Um, thank you so much, Chancellor. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for having such clarity about the moment that we are in and what is required as we go forward. And it is wonderful to be here with you on the beautiful campus of UMass Boston. We've had the opportunity to visit many times and to see what's happening here. Uh, as this is just a terrific place to begin today's discussion about higher education and what we need to do. So thank you, thank you so much, Chancellor. Really appreciate it. it we are also um, really happy to be, I'm happy to be here with, with several people. Uh, I, I want to say first, of course, it's a delight to be here with our fabulous Attorney General, Andrea Campbell, and members of her team. We have, we're all one team, but uh, specifically in our administration, we have our Secretary of Education, Pat Tutwiler, our Commissioner of Higher Ed, Noe Ortega, our undersecretaries, members of our board. We're just so... Um, Delighted to be with all of you, you who are such dedicated educators and leaders. I want to thank members of our advisory council to advance representation in education, who we brought together in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision, in anticipation, really, of, of the Supreme Court's decision. Um, it is because of these leaders that we are here today, building community and taking new steps forward. I also want to celebrate the students who are here today, some of whom I had an opportunity to meet along with their mentors. Uh, today is about your education, your future, your opportunities. Today marks a powerful moment. It's a moment to recognize the unlimited talent and potential in the diverse young people across Massachusetts. And more than that, it's about how we invest in them because they are the future of our state. We can have a lot of commentary and discussions about some of what is so unfortunate that's transpired in our country over the last several months, several years, the actions of certain governors, the actions of certain state legislatures, the actions of certain federal administrations. We can talk about all of that. I think it's important, though, to focus what we're focused on today, which is how we move forward in the context of all of this and how we transcend and transform along the way. It is simply wrong to suggest that every student in Massachusetts or in this country begins from the same baseline. They don't. That's a fact. It is also wrong to assume that America provides a level playing field for all students. It doesn't. We don't. We never have. It's also wrong to believe that colleges and universities don't need to be intentional about how we increase diversity, equity, and access. Everyone, not just our colleges and universities, but all of us in government, in business, and in academe, need to bring an energy and an intentionality that we haven't seen before to this endeavor. That is the context of the times that we are in. That is what this moment requires. And that is what today is all about. 
We're proud in Massachusetts, so we're proud to be home to the first public school, public library. We enshrine the right to an education in our Constitution. Not everyone does that. We know the importance of education, and we also know it's under attack in so many places, as certain legislatures or school committees look to rewrite history. Black history is American history. We believe in DEI for so many reasons, but unfortunately in so many places, there are those who are looking to take us backwards. We are not going to allow that to happen here in Massachusetts. It is counter to everything we know about the value of education and what's possible within the talent of each person if we simply take a moment to recognize the dignity and the worth and the capacity of everyone and we work together to find ways to lift people up. You know, even before the Supreme Court announced what we anticipated was going to be a terrible decision, and it is a terrible decision, we thought about ways to move forward. It's why we expanded access to free college and career planning tools, including the MIFA Pathway and DESE's My Career and Academic Plan Tool, or MICAP. We brought together this advisory council to have the conversation. In our state budget, which I was proud to sign a few weeks ago, and many thank yous to, to the legislature, and also I want to recognize Chair of uh, higher Education, Dave Rogers, who is with us this morning. This is what was contained in our budget, some of what was contained in our budget. Making school meals, breakfast and lunch, free to every single student in the state permanently. Expanding early college and career innovation pathways in our high schools. Establishing in-state in tuition equity for all students, no matter where they were born or what their status is. We made, we made community college free to those 25 years and older through our Mass Reconnect program. We're doing much more than fighting back, though. We're taking positive steps forward, and what I just talked about in our budget is part of that, um, and today is very much part of that. Today, we have new resources to share. Our team at the Executive Office of Education, including DHE and DESE, has been working with Attorney General Campbell's office over the last several months. And together, we have helped develop a set of guidelines to help our schools, colleges, and universities create more equitable access to education. Now, we know there's been concern and confusion about what is legal and allowable now. These guidelines make clear every campus's continued rights and continued opportunities to expand access and advance equity and inclusion on every campus. Because we want you to know, don't stop doing what you're doing. You can continue to remove financial barriers. You can advance your DEIA work. You can do outreach and partner with organizations that work with underrepresented students. Colleges in K-12 schools can forge important partnerships. You can provide planning resources to students and their families, and so much more. These guidelines are here to help support educators, counselors, college staff, and leaders who work to support students every day in Massachusetts. We want to make sure that everyone has the tools and also the confidence. This is the right thing to do. This is what we must do. That's what today is about. Building culture and community is so important right now. We know this work takes commitment. We know that young people are working their hearts out. We know that our teachers and counselors in our schools have had to confront barriers coming through a pandemic um, and then faced with certain, certain uh, court decisions. It can all get discouraging. We've got school committee members, superintendents, principals um, who are out there working to center equity in all they do in spite of some of the hate and the vitriol they see coming from certain places. We have university staff doing community outreach, embracing college partnerships, welcoming and supporting diverse students on your campus. We want everyone in our schools to know that you are not on your own. And look, I know that the team and I will be out there keeping these conversations going 
urging everyone to make this a priority, uh, including employers who have tremendous stakes in what is happening with our education here in the state and what is happening with our students. And so I'm here today just to deliver the message that we are grateful as an administration to be able to partner with all of you, to work with all of you. I want to thank um, you for the work and the commitment you've shown in just being here today, but most importantly, the work that you're going to do in the days, weeks, and months ahead. You know, this work requires, as I say, a level of intentionality and energy. It also requires perseverance, sustained engagement. Things just don't turn on a dime. And we're 400 years in the making with so many of our disparities that have only grown and exacerbated through time. So it's just to say, I want you to keep the faith on the work that you need to do. It is so important. It is so worthwhile. And I know of any place in this country right now that's going to do it, that's going to deliver, that's going to make it happen, it's going to be Massachusetts. And it's going to happen because of partnership and the teamwork of everyone here in the room. So thank you on behalf of Secretary Tutwiler and our entire team, Commissioner Ortega, um, all the folks working across the administration who are so eager to support and embrace and further the work that you were do doing. So feel strong today. Um, and feel empowered today and know that we will continue to be by you with guidance, support in all different ways. I mentioned teamwork and partnership. I can't think of a better teammate or partner on this cause than Attorney General Andrea Campbell. I've had the opportunity now to work alongside her and her team uh, for the last 10 months, and she is a fantastic leader, and she is a particularly fantastic leader for the time that we are in right now, for the issues that confront us as a state, for the issues that confront us as a country. And so it's my honor and privilege to introduce our Attorney General, Andrea Campbell. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. We're here to get things done. We have work to do. It's beautiful outside. We're at a beautiful campus with a beautiful view. It's not snowing. It's not raining. Really, people, someone served us coffee and food and juice. Thank you to the people who served us. I always believe in starting from a place of gratitude. So good morning, everyone. <laughs> and again, thank you to the chancellor of this incredible institution for your work your dedication. Thank you to your staff. You don't do this work by yourself. Thank you again to all those folks who served us coffee and food this morning. We often forget them, but I needed my coffee this morning, so thank you to them. Of course, thank you to our incredible governor for the work that she's doing every single day with her administration to advance these efforts. We do it in partnership and stay in regular communication, so I'm grateful for her leadership as well. I also, of course, am grateful for our Secretary of Education, who is I'm introducing Tutwiler, so good to see you. Thank you, of course, to Commissioner Ortega, uh, Riley, board members, our young people for their leadership, and of course, all of you who are in this room, fighting the fight every single day at moments and in moments where it's probably completely challenging and very difficult. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't add the international context that we're dealing with, Ukraine, of course, what's happening in Israel, Gaza. And as I stress to folks in my office, uh, we can call out terrorism and terrorist attacks by Hamas, while also, of course, making sure that we're extending empathy and compassion to both Israelis and Palestinians as well. There's a lot of trauma going on right now, including in my office. And like I say to everyone, all deserve empathy and compassion and understanding. We don't have to be experts on that conflict, but we have to show that um, everywhere we go. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because the folks who are in this room working on half of my team represent and have deep connections to those regions. I am I absolutely honored to be here with each and every one of you today and really grateful for the attendance in this room. And if you haven't looked around, do look around. The diversity, the attendance is remarkable. So thank you. Um, I know we all care about equity efforts, but not just, of course, in the context of education, 
but also in the context of government, in the workplace, and so many other places, we're playing a crucial role in fighting and overcoming systemic racial disparities that exist. And I know this room of experts gets that every single day. So when I say it's an honor and privilege to be here working in collaboration and partnership with each and every one of you, I mean it. Um, like many of you, I was deeply disappointed with the Supreme Court's affirmative action decision, not only because the court's decision ignores history, of course, but also the ongoing reality of racism and racial inequities that continue to exist in society, causing significant harm to especially black and brown people, but also because it was a huge setback to our efforts to ensure our education system actually provides equal access and opportunity to all of our students. It was another example of this court becoming very political and substituting its own judgment for the judgment of experts, including those in this very room, who deeply understand the importance of diversity in our classrooms and on our campuses. And while this decision was a setback, I, along with my team, will not allow it to stand in the way of progress and moving forward to ensuring the next generation of students actually have greater access to higher ed institutions and to all of the things that they envision for themselves. This particular decision, while it may have taken away some of our tools, I stressed to my team when it came out, it did not take away our toolbox. The decision was about race-based preferences and higher, ed higher education missions, and that's it. It was not about efforts to recruit a diverse student population. It was not about breaking down arbitrary barriers that keep people out. The decision was not about creating welcoming and supportive cultures within our institution so all students and all folks can thrive. It was not about businesses or our corporate community, for example, utilizing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. All of these efforts remain legal, and they are critical to ensuring our schools and our economy and our, and our society are functioning, of course, and thriving. And if that wasn't clear, today I'm really honored to be working in partnership with the governor and her administration, of course, to issue this joint guidance in the education context to support these efforts. The guidance builds upon the Biden administration's recommendations and focuses on steps that the higher ed, higher ed education system can continue to take to break down barriers and ensure access for historically underrepresented populations. It also includes ways that colleges and universities can work with our K through 12 systems and schools in their efforts, and of course, how elementary and secondary schools can continue to foster safe, supportive, and inclusive environments for all of its students as they prepare for them to go to college and of course, on to a career. The governor and I both want to be crystal clear and send a signal to our education community and all of you that certain efforts to break down barriers to access and create a safe and supportive school environment are vital, are legal, and can and should continue. And we are here, of course, along with my team to support those efforts in every way we can. I just realized my pages were reversed. Because before I wrap up, which was the conclusion part, I want to be specific on what the guidance looks like. So as we said, even with the court's blow to affirmative action, there are approaches consistent with the ruling that our education community can and should adopt. There's a lot universities can do right now. This includes, by example, you can use admissions criteria that look beyond grades and test scores to actually consider an applicant's life experiences, how they overcome adversity, and how those experiences can, can contribute to your campus. You can review admissions processes to actually identify potential barriers to access for historically underrepresented students. That means looking at legacy admissions, at critical and curricular requirements and testing requirements, and consider how and whether they actually help advance the academic community you hope to create. You can make specific and intentional efforts to reach particular groups of applicants including making every effort to recruit and support transfer students, for example, especially learners from Massachusetts community colleges. You can develop more robust relationships 
with our middle schools and our high schools all across the Commonwealth, including off of the east part, eastern part of our state, and get out into communities to build and make sure that these populations and these schools know about your programming, know about your initiatives to create greater diversity. That's why we, in our guidance, don't just specifically talk to our higher ed institutions. We also are including steps that our K through 12 administrators, teachers, and counselors and staff can also take, which is critically important. And this includes, for example, taking targeted action so our students from underserved communities, including communities of color, are aware of and have access to and can participate in the programs that drive diversity, access, and most importantly, educate them about the wide variety of college, college, college institutions that exist in Massachusetts and beyond. Believe it or not, there are many programs that you do every single day that folks in the K through 12 system don't know exist, don't know how to access, don't know how to apply to. We, of course, can also work with our K through 12 systems to make sure they're taking affirmative steps to create and maintain a positive school and climate free of hate and bullying. And we absolutely want to do this in partnership with you. My office understands deeply that if it's a top-down approach, we'll be unsuccessful in our efforts here, and we won't have the greatest impact we all want to have collectively. So I'm here to say not only will we continue to work in partnership with you, we hope this guidance offers specifics on what you can and can't do. We want to continue to be a resource to you as you navigate these new waters. And we want, of course, continue to be a partner in the work. And I'll just end by, this is very personal for me as it is for many folks who are in the office. I attended Princeton University and UCLA Law School. I was the first in my family to go to college. And I know what it took for me to get there. I attended great K through 12 systems. I went to five Boston public schools, all of which were ex excellent and had resources and had programming designed to let me know about the colleges that were available to me and the work I would need to do to be successful in applying. This work is critical. As we think about a thriving economy, as we think about jobs that are going unfilled, we need folks with skill sets, we need folks to have access. And I also understand the Princeton, the Harvards of the world are not gonna solve a worker shortage issue. It is really important to invest in our community colleges and state universities and to, of course, make sure they have everything they would need as our private institutions do. We support those efforts too. But thank you all so very much for being here this morning. Thank you for the work that you do every single day. It doesn't go un unacknowledged, so thank you. And lastly, but also very excitedly, I'm really excited to welcome our Secretary of Education who every single day is taking on this work with his team. Patrick, please come up. Thank you for everything that you do, Secretary. Thank you.